right. Let's see. Let's do a quick mic check. Becky Presley, can you hear me okay back where you are? All right. All right, everybody. We are going to get started. It's 4 o'clock. I told the church this morning I'm punctual. I better be a man of my word. Um, let me just say a couple things before we have prayer and just get going. First off, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. This is just, this is my cup of tea. Uh, to just sit down and, and look at scripture as a church family. Uh, let me say a couple things. I was asked last year, uh, any idea of having a bathroom break? Because <laughs> we'll go for a while, and here's the thing, we're not going to do bathroom breaks, that would just eat up so much time. We do have giveaway moments, three of them, that kind of cause a bit of a timeout, so feel free to use those as a natural break as far as the lecture goes, or come and go as you please, okay? So if, if you need to go get a drink of water, uh, go to the restroom, go make a phone call, uh, just come and go as you please, and I'm just going to keep on going. I don't want to eat too much time by having actual breaks and stuff. So just wanted to give you a heads up about that. And let me also explain for those of you who uh, are here, maybe this is the first Ember Lecture you've been to. We, we did these all last year. Let me explain why we call them Ember Lectures. And if you were here last year, let me just remind us all why they're called this. Um, I, I love sitting around a campfire. As a reminder, I don't like going camping. But I love sitting around a campfire. I love the idea of sitting around having a good conversation while the embers are just sort of still going. And I have found that you can have some of the best, some of the richest, some of the most intimate conversations with people when you're all just sort of mindlessly staring at just glowing embers. And so I want to be able to do that with Scripture in a relatively big group setting. As I just want us to feel like we're just sitting around, we're not in a hurry, and we're in awe. We're just staring at the Scriptures like glowing embers. Uh, there's not a lot of program to this. It's just me talking. And we don't have to worry about who's up next and how many more songs and, and this or that. It's just very simple and I want us just to enjoy some very relaxed time uh, with Scripture. So that's, that's why we call these the Ember Lectures. And they're called lectures because that's what they are. Hopefully you, you don't walk away saying that was the most boring lecture I've ever been to. Um, but this is just straight up very focused time in Scripture. So this is why we're here. Uh, and we had a great time last year. If you did not go to last year's lectures and you're interested in seeing them, they are on our website. They're archived. We spent four weeks just thinking about the identity and nature of Scripture as God's Word. Just sort of an intro to the Bible. All this month, we're going to be looking at the Old Testament, the plan, Lord willing, next year. If you guys are up for it, then I would intend on studying all year and getting ready for New Testament lectures. And so we'll just see where God goes from there. So that's kind of where we are in the big picture. I want to pray. And then I want to tell you 12 reasons why I want to teach you the Old Testament. And then I'm just going to try to tell the story of the Old Testament. Now let me let you know before I pray, before I start telling the story, I've never done that before. I've never just told the story of the Old Testament with any extended period of time. I don't know how well it's going to go. Let me clarify, I'm not going to pretend like I'm characters, so I will not try to put on the persona of Abraham or Isaac or anything like that. But I will just try to tell the story. It's not going to be flamboyant. But what I hope is we'll walk through and two things at least will happen. We'll, we'll come away on the other side realizing that there is a story that the Old Testament gives us that is unified. Certainly part of the Old and New Testament story, which we'll get into in a couple weeks. I want us to see the story and then I also want us to just glean some of the riches as we go along the way. Some really neat insights that I think really will shed light on Scripture, will hopefully grow your hunger for Scripture and grow our hunger as a church body for Scripture as well, okay? So with all that, why don't you just bow your head, close your eyes, and um, just take a deep breath. I realize you may have had a busy afternoon. You may have a lot going on. This may be quite a sacrifice for you to come and spend 
an hour and a half, two hours here. And so I want to thank you for that. But just take a deep breath and let God minister to you. Just say, you know what, let's be still. Uh, we're here together. We don't want to be in a hurry. God, I, I do ask that. I pray that tonight is a blessing of being calm together as a church family. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters who were willing to come here on a Sunday afternoon, which in so many ways can feel like a very inconvenient time slot. I thank you that they're here. I thank you for the, the gift of being able to come and do this, how much I'll enjoy it, and I hope we all do. God, I pray that you would minister to us. I pray that this is not just informative, but I pray that your spirit will minister to us. Lord, I pray for those who, who are maybe very vividly feeling the weight of burdens right now, whether it's a worry or a fear or a, um, a wound of some sort, a concern. Lord, I pray that, that they, they sense that you are ministering to them tonight, that it's no accident that they're here, that you have uh, joy to give them, you have work to accomplish, you want to speak to all of us. So Lord, we sit around your word, and we thank you for the intimacy that you allow us to enjoy as we gather around your word, knowing that you speak to us. I pray that that would take place tonight. I pray that you would use all month of these lectures to grow our appetite for scripture, to grow our joy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me also say, those of you who were here last year may remember I had handouts. Don't have them tonight. I don't plan on having them next week either. Just by telling a story, it doesn't really lend to it. Probably will have handouts for the next couple of weeks, the last two, in case you're wondering. You did not miss those on the way in. Let me tell you why I want to teach the Old Testament to you. These are 12 reasons. We could probably come up with 100 here are 12 that came to mind. Feel free if you'd like to write these down or just sort of soak them in. I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. Number one, I want to teach you the Old Testament so that you will understand, appreciate, and love the Old Testament more. I want you to walk away tonight and, Lord willing, if you are able to come or at least watch all of the lectures, I want you to go away from all four sessions understanding the Old Testament better. Anybody ever felt confused by the Old Testament? Yes, I, and that's always going to be the case to a degree. But there's a lot we can do to understand better. Therefore, I want you to appreciate it more and therefore love it more. We need to love the Old Testament. About to start preaching my last lecture if I get into that anymore. Number two. I'm teaching the Old Testament to you this month because I want you to better understand, appreciate, and love the Bible more. Just a, a quick glimpse into where we're heading. The Old Testament is part of the Christian Bible, a significant part, roughly the first two-thirds to three-fourths of the Bible. So if we understand, appreciate, and love the Old Testament better after this month comes and goes, that means we will understand, appreciate, and love the Bible more. And I want us as a church to always love the Bible more and more and more. Number three, I want to teach the Old Testament to you so you will know and love God more. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Old Testament is God's revelation to us. We love God more if we understand, appreciate, and love the Old Testament more. It's His Word. Father, Son, and Spirit. We need the Old Testament for that. Number four, so you will love one another better. I firmly, firmly believe as a church, if we are continually grounding ourselves on Scripture, if the Old Testament is Scripture, which it is, then we will love one another better. The more we hunger God's word, the more we hear God's word, the more we live accordingly, relate with one another accordingly. Number five, so you will have more victory over sin. So yes, we call these lectures. I realize that that, that has a tone to it. But please know this, I believe spiritual warfare is taking place in here tonight. 
as it does every time the church gathers, as it does every time a Bible's open. It's like spiritual warfare just is. That's why we have to put on the armor of God. If we learn the Old Testament more, one of the implications is we can have more of a victorious experience over sin. You see a God who conquers the enemies all throughout the Old Testament. Number six, so you will evangelize better. If you know the Old Testament better, you'll better understand how to talk with someone about the gospel. You might even have more understanding about certain questions you hear asked or discussions you hear where sometimes things may seem foggy to you and you're like, ah, I really don't know how to answer that, which is okay, we all have those, but the more we understand the Old Testament, the better grasp we have of it, the better we can evangelize. Number seven, so you will worship better. That is ultimately what this all is about. This whole church thing is worshiping God. If we understand the Old Testament better, we will be better worshipers. If you understand the picture of worship all throughout the Old Testament, you will better worship Jesus Christ. You can't sing about the sacrifice with all of the Old Testament in the backdrop of your mind and not feel your spirit just reverberate in worship for Jesus Christ who was sacrificed for you, the Lamb of God. Number eight, I'm teaching the Old Testament this month. So we will have better children's ministries, better youth ministries, better senior adult ministries, better music ministries, better ministries all across the board. The more we know the Old Testament, the better we can build our church on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. Our children ministries need the Old Testament. Our students need the Old Testament. Senior adults, you need the Old Testament. Choir members, praise team leaders, Men's ministry, women's ministry, we need the Old Testament. Number nine, so we will prepare well for our church's future. We, we always need to have the future of our church in mind. Where God's taking us, I, I speak of the horizon quite a bit when I'm talking to people, especially when meeting people who are new at the church, they're wanting to learn more. I often talk about the horizon of the church, sort of where God's taking us. and We may not clearly see off in the distance, but... We're going this direction. We don't know how we're going to get there. The better we know the Old Testament, the better we'll be able to prepare well in so many ways for our church's future. Number 10, I'm teaching the Old Testament to you because I want want us to see healthier marriages and families in this church. We need healthier couples. We need healthier families. And yes, Having a better grasp of the Old Testament helps with that. Number 11, so we will do missions better. You may or may have never thought of this, but the Old Testament is in so many ways a missions document. So I want us to do missions better as a church. So we are going to dig into the Old Testament and finally in this follows along with the idea of doing missions better because I want us to plant churches. I want us to be better prepared to plant churches down the road, locally, globally, wherever God would have us plant churches, wherever God would have us multiply, just like this morning. If you're here this morning, we are blessed with all the resources, and we're called to put those to work. And what ended up happening? Multiplication. You came with five more. Good, I'll give you even more. I'll give you two. You come back with two more. It's a multiplication of two. You keep doing that. God can do things we can't even imagine right now. The better we understand the Old Testament, that helps us become better prepared to ultimately even plant churches. So those are 12 reasons. Like I said, we could come up uh, with several more. But that is why I want to tell you the story of the Old Testament. So here's what I want you to do. Go ahead and turn to the first page of the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 1. And like I said, I have not done this before, Um, so just kind of hang in there with me. There are going to be portions where you'll do just fine holding your Bible open in front of you, reading along. There will be times where I'm kind of bouncing around a little bit. I'll do the best I can to kind of keep us all on track as far as where we are in the Scriptures. There will be times where you're just looking up at me, and you're just sort of uh, trying to hear what I have to say. But we're going to start with a lot of Scripture right up front. And um, we'll just see how far we get in this first set of notes here. 
I want us to focus on Genesis chapter 1 and 2 for a few moments. I want us to hear how the story starts. So the Old Testament is a story. If I'm telling the story of the Old Testament, I want to make sure it's clear that it is a story. I'm not just creating a story out of the Old Testament. I'm trying to tell the story that the Old Testament is. And so let's see how it begins the way the divine author wanted to begin his story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now let's take enough time and let me highlight one word, God. In my notes, the word God is bold, it is underlined, and it is in italics. I wanted to make sure that this word stood out to me, so I make sure it stands out to you. The story begins by telling us about one person, God. This book ultimately is about him. This is a story about God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything. You and I aren't even close to the most important part of this story. And if that hurts your feelings, that's the Holy Spirit doing some powerful work in your life. This is a story about God. Okay, let's keep going. We've got a few more verses left in the Old Testament. We better cruise, right? Verse 2. Skip to verse 3. God said, let there be light. Now, I have another word that is bold, italics, underlined on my notes. It's the word said. God said something. The story begins with God speaking. So think about how significant God's word is. Already off the bat, three verses in, we have to just take a moment and realize God's word has power. This story doesn't go anywhere without God, and it doesn't go anywhere without God's word doing something, creating the heavens and the earth. So just kind of listen as we skip along. God said these types of things. He said, let there be light. I'm the one that came in here originally this afternoon and turned the lights on. I did not, this may surprise some of you, I did not walk in and say light. I had to push the button. And I had to rely on all the electricians and everything that was designed and the technology of the light bulbs and all that stuff. I know there are filaments and things like that. I don't even know if there are filaments anymore. Are there filaments and light bulbs anymore? Why are we talking about this? I don't know. But I could not come in and say light. But God can. God can take nothing and say light. God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. So think like this, waters separated, waters above, waters below. Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. He takes all the water below, he brings it all together, and he lets dry land appear. God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed. So now he's putting things on the land. He says, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens, stars. Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds. And then he says this. He says, let us make man in our image. This is verse 26, if you need to kind of Track along. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And then Moses tells us this. He says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens. And over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now let me remind you of something I've shared multiple times before. When you see repetition in scripture, it's very helpful to note that. Kind of pay attention. Here we see it's being repeated that they are to... Have dominion to fill the earth and subdue it and just 
have dominion over the animal kingdom. And then we're told that God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now, some of you, many of you know that all throughout that chapter, had we read all the verses, we would have seen after the days, God looked and said it was good. And then he looked after another day, he said it's good. And then we get to this grand culmination that includes mankind. Men and women are sort of this this crowning culmination of creation. And we see that God said, behold, it's very good. And we hone in on that. That's a good thing. Very good. You see this progression. But I'd like to highlight another word real quick. I want you to look, verse, I want to make sure we're all seeing this. Look at verse 30, 31, chapter 1, verse 31. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now, I just want to pull out the past tense there because I know it's about to be past tense pretty quickly. It was very good. The Old Testament tells us that it wasn't long after all this happened that things went very poorly. Things went south. I want you just to go ahead and look ahead to Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, the serpent, which we are told was more crafty than any other beast of the field which the Lord God had made, this serpent came and he questioned God's word. He questioned the word of God to man and woman, particularly the woman. He comes and he asks a question. So what is he doing? Think about this, if I can put it in kind of a silly way. The serpent questioned the creator's creator. Did God really say this? Things go south when God's word is questioned when the creator's creator is questioned. He asked the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? You probably know he's twisting scripture, if you know the book of Genesis a little bit. And then she answers him, but she doesn't answer the question correctly. She misquotes God's word. It's off to a rocky start. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, neither shall you touch it. That's where she kind of veers off a little bit, significantly, lest you die. So what I want to do is take a moment right here. I want to consider the significance of what's taking place at this point in history. And I mean like we're at the beginning of it. I mean this... History starts, and boom, here we are. Let's think of what's going on in this place. God's word is challenged and questioned with a false, misleading suggestion of what God has said. And in response, someone responds by misrepresenting what God has said, getting God's word wrong. That's where we are in history already. God's word said, be fruitful, eat the fruit of all of these trees, just don't eat the fruit of this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The serpent lies to the man and the woman. You will, sh- you will not surely die, he says in verse 4. So we're told that she sees that the tree was good for food. She sees it was a delight to the eyes. And she also sees that it can make one wise, but I would say allegedly. You see how temptation is working already in history. It looks good for food. It's very appealing to look at, and if it can make me wise, and we have to put quotation marks around that, we know that that's not what happens. So she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew, they knew, they know something now. There's a promise. It's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The serpent says, God doesn't want you to eat that because then you'll be like him, knowing all this, and let's just see what they end up knowing, what kind of knowledge they really receive. They knew that they were naked. The implication, now they know what shame feels like. Now they know what exposure feels like. We're told God found Adam and Eve 
hiding in the garden. They used to walk with God in the garden. Now they're hiding and they acknowledged him what they had done. So God cursed the snake forever. And he promised that there would be enmity between him and the woman and between his offspring and her offspring. He says that he would bruise the serpent's head and the serpent would bruise her offspring's heel. In other words, a promised son will overcome the serpent. God told the woman that she would have pain in her childbearing. Any amens to that, ladies? Also, she would desire to rule over her husband, but he would rule over her. God told Adam that the ground will be cursed, and in pain he would eat of it all the days of his life. Ever since this moment, work has been hard work in a way that drains joy and energy. By the sweat of his face, he would eat bread until he returned to the ground, returning to the dust from which he was made. And I just got to point out, you talk about down to earth. That's what God says, now you're going to be down to earth. You came from the dust, you're going to go back to the dust now. But God did make for Adam and for his wife garments out of animal skins. Just last night, driving around, I get asked by my daughter, or she just says, she says, I wonder who invented clothes. I said, well, we know the answer to that. God did. God made coverings, garments out of animal skins. And I want you to realize this. I want you to soak this in. This is, this is some of the, the, just the juice that we can extract out of the riches of God's word. This gesture seems to hint at the price of redemption that God had already determined to pay for his lost people. Think about it. A life was sacrificed. Blood was shed. And man and woman are covered. We go on to Genesis 4. In Genesis 4, it doesn't take long to see that the effects of sin are severe, and that's putting it mildly. Adam and Eve have two sons. Their names are Cain and Abel. Cain, out of jealousy, kills Abel. The scene portrays how this, the beginning of a spiral of corruption on earth. Once they disobeyed God and ate of the, the fruit of that one forbidden tree, the world spirals into corruption. In chapter 6, look at verse 5. The world has continued to get worse, and we're told in chapter 6, verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And I believe we hammered on this last year. Let me just take a moment and just tell you men. By the way, this goes for all of us as humans. I know this about you. Every intention of the thoughts of your heart is only evil continually. That's the truth about us. Apart from God. Unreconciled from God. This is the depravity of humanity. God regretted making mankind. It grieved him. We can't even wrap our minds around that. Especially when we grow up, understandably so, rightfully so, being told what? God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. Jesus loves you. And he does. It's so hard for us to wrap our minds around the reality of sin causing God to experience an emotion that overwhelms us. We can't comprehend. He grieves that he created humankind. And so the Lord said in chapter 6, verse 7, he says, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. Now, I want to read that again. I want you to try to hear what's happening based on what we've already come across. He says, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. You see what's happening? God would undo creation. This is just backpedaling now. Everything that we saw him do in chapter 1, he's, he is taking back what he said. He spoke it all into creation. Now he's taking back what he said. The, the tragedy of this, I think, is often just not appreciated. He is undoing creation. 
Go ahead and look at chapter 6, verse 8. Hopefully it's like this in your translation, in the version that I use. The first word is but. But. Right here we see this amazing moment of, of grace and mercy and patience and redemption. God is diligent with his purposes. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. He says, I am sorry, at the end of verse 7, I am sorry that I have made them. Right there, that could have been the end of the Bible. Right there. He could have just washed his hands of us, been done with us. But Noah found favor. If you know anything about the idea of favor, it always kind of has this idea of kindness and grace in it. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. There is a man named Noah. He, for some reason, is looked upon favorably by God. God sent a flood that covered the earth to judge the world. He preserved Noah and his family and the animal kingdom in the ark last Sunday, I believe. I made the point, this is not cute and cuddly. This was horrific. Just picture it. I think at least two movies in the last several years have come out about it. Picture what the flood would have been like as people realized this water is not going down. And there was one place to escape it. It was this ark that God called Noah to build. And so he preserved humanity, and the animal kingdom according to his plans. And yet, things did not get any better. In Genesis 11, it seems as if the fallenness of humanity has culminated. So here's what's happening. In their pride and in their arrogance, and I would even say in their insecurity, they wanted to build a tower. They wanted to build a tower, we're told, to make a name for themselves It's the pride coming in, which if you think about it, if everybody lived at the same place, they all taught the same language, they wanted to build a name for themselves, how weird is that? Like for who for who else to know? They wanted to build a tower to make a name for themselves. This was an exercise of complete futility. It wouldn't accomplish that at all. So they built the tower as high as possible, hoping to stay together and reach into the heavens. They thought that that would be accomplishing something. And yet we're told that God, the creator of the universe, had to come down to have a little look-see at their tower. He has to come down to see this amazing tower they're building. And he confused their language so that they could no longer understand one another. And he forced them to do what they were supposed to have done all along. They were supposed to spread throughout the earth that that he had made for them. He's like, you guys have to scatter. I told you, multiply and fill the earth and have dominion over it, and so he forces them out. He forces them to be fruitful. He forces them to multiply and fill the earth. But it was an earth that had fallen into utter depths of corruption. And that's where we find ourselves at the end of Genesis chapter 11, and things take a big turn in chapter 12. Here's what I want to do. I want to call a timeout, and I want us to do uh, some giveaways here. Okay, I am excited about some giveaways. We need to get our... Our names here, uh, we have our buckets. And by the way, I do not have any stickers to throw at y'all this year. So if you did not eat and you're hangry, yo. Uh, this one's children. All right. All right, small group. I'll put this over here. And everyone else. Okay, we have three categories of people in here. Okay. Now, now we have, we have just normal people. Okay, that's most of us, just normal, average, okay, nothing to speak of. Then we have our small group leaders who are like all-stars, right? Sunday school leaders, grow group leaders, you know, any kind of ministry leaders. We have y'all in here, your second category. And then we have superheroes. Those are children's ministry leaders. So we have giveaways for, for all three kinds. And so here's what I've done already. I've mailed to our small group leaders and Sunday school leaders This book here, uh, this book is written by a man named Christopher J.H. Wright, and the book's title is The Old Testament 
in seven sentences. And uh, this is the book, and, and someone accused it of being run-on sentences, if you can make a whole book out of seven sentences. But what he does is he takes seven sentences that he highlights, obviously as significant verses of Scripture. Let me read these to you. One is Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The second sentence is Genesis 12-3, which we'll see in a moment. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. The third sentence is Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. The fourth sentence is 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. The Lord has sought a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people. The fifth sentence is Micah chapter 6, verse 8. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? The sixth sentence is Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the one who brings good news. And the seventh sentence is Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. And so he took these seven sentences. He feels that they are representative, as well as seven verses could be, of the Old Testament, and he has some really good discussion about these that are chapter length. So I'm going to give these away as I pull a name out of a hat here, and I'm trying to remember, I think it's, it's the yellow one, right? For, is, are, are the normal average, just run-of-the-mill folks, yellow, us? Okay, all right. The, the pastor was so encouraging tonight. All right, let's see who we have here. Deborah Chaddock. Everybody give her a round of applause. All right, bring it to you. It is a joy and an honor to bring someone a new book. So someone whispered something to me. What was that? Oh, well, happy birthday. All right. We'll be giving a couple more of those as the night goes on. I want to go ahead also and give away one of our books for small group leaders. All right, so you guys are the all-stars, right? You're getting in the Word every week, and you're teaching us, making sure we're on the straight and narrow. Oh, well, let me hold this. I'll look at the name and hold the suspense while I describe the book. Ooh, she's going to be excited about this. All right. This book is by a gentleman named Michael Williams, and the title, which is awesome, How to Read the Bible Through the Jesus Lens, the subtitle is A Guide to Christ-Focused Reading of Scripture. This is the kind of stuff that I always want to put before you guys is how do we read the Bible well? How do we see it as one book? How do we see it as a Christ-centered document? And this covers each book of the Bible with some discussion, some introduction for that particular book, and it kind of points how you can read that book, sort of seeing it as a document that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And the winner of this book, our first all-star, is Becky Presley. Yeah. All right. All right. Now, we're going we're gonna to wait for the superhuman gift towards the end. I've got, one, I've got one superhero gift for children's leaders. So if you are a children's leader, here's the thing. You, you have, like, more chances to win because you can win one of these like Becky just did. But you can also win one of these... For children's ministry, and if you're like, that's not fair, leading children isn't fair. <laughs> Can I get an amen there? All right. So if you want to win more books in your life, go talk to Nikki Hanlon right over there. She'll, she'll help you out. All right, let's keep on going. I want you to go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 12. I've told you before that in many ways, Genesis 12 begins this this massive new direction in the Bible. Things have just spiraled down for creation. And yet God starts to do something about it in Genesis chapter 12. This chapter is one of the key chapters in all the Bible. A new day has dawned, so to speak. And God calls a man named Abram. His name, ironically, means exalted father. He does not have any children. And he's really, really old. His very name would continually remind him of the insufficiency, the lack in his and his wife's life, in their culture. So I want you to read with me, just follow along, Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. God says to Abram, 
Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. If, you're, uh, if you like underlining in your Bible, you may want to underline the word land. You may have done that from last year's lectures too. I will make of you a great nation. You might want to underline the word nation. And I will bless you and make your name great. Underline the word name. So that you will be a blessing. Underline that word blessing. So he says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Remember, that's one of the sentences highlighted in this book. So here, here's sort of an outline of the promise that God has just given when he calls Abram. Land, a nation, a great name, and blessing. Okay, Land, nation, a great name, and blessing. Now think about this. Abram is being promised even more than all of the people were seeking in the whole Tower of Babel episode. They were seeking these kinds of things. This is the way that sin works. You seek something that you desire, which in and of itself is probably not wrong to desire, but you seek it in a way that you're not supposed to seek it. And to fix it, God says, I'm going to pick this man, Abram, and I'm going to give him all of that and more. I'm going to give him a great name. I'm going to take him to a promised land. He's going to become a great nation, and he will be showered with my blessing. And on top of that, through him, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is a reiteration of the original call of mankind, including a victory over their cursed enemies. This is all through, I want you to hear echoes of Genesis 3, this is all through promised offspring. Remember, God tells Eve, your offspring is going to crush his head. There's a promised offspring. Now Abram is promising offspring. I'm going to make of you a great nation. In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God promised Abram a son. Even though he and his wife Sarah were too old to have children, close to a hundred years old, God stayed faithful to his promise. He tells Abram in Genesis 17 verse 7, if you want to skip ahead there. In Genesis 17, he is, he's changed his name Here's what he tells them. Verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. Let me just make sure we, we understand. I know that many of you know this, but the word testament is a translation of the word covenant. We're studying the old covenant this month. He says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings or the land of your wandering, wanderings, all the land of Canaan. That's the name of the promised land, Canaan. He says, for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. God changed Abram's name to Abraham. Now that name means not just exalted father, but father of a multitude. And Abraham followed God's call by faith. Which, by the way, is a very important phrase in Christian history. By faith. You need to cling to those two words. We follow God by faith. Even though there were many times when he doubted and wondered and struggled... And he did things imperfectly. We want to emulate the characters of the Bible when they're doing something for us to emulate. But don't, don't think like I used to think growing up. I thought all of these characters in the Bible, they must have been so awesome and godly. We need to be more and more and more like them. No, sometimes the Bible is showing us don't be like them. But Abraham does show us this demonstration of faith. He waited for God to fulfill his promises. He struggled with patience. He came up with plan B's. And there were some doozies. 
but he still waited over all. God was faithful. Abraham and Sarah had a son named Isaac. Now we're flying in history. Isaac would have a son named Jacob. Isaac's name means laughter. Jacob means like supplanter. He's kind of a conniver. Jacob was given the name Israel, which means he who wrestles with God, something to that effect. He would have 12 sons, and these sons are the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. Their names are Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. And by the way, Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, would become the namesakes of two half-tribes of Israel. You don't have to remember all that. Hang in. Now, raise your hand if you were not here for last year's lectures. Raise your hand if this is your first ever Ember lecture. Excellent. So glad you're here. Now, one of the things I taught last year, and I'll tell you now, I'll just remind all of us, when you're reading Old Testament names, all right, what's my trick? What's my encouragement? You just read it with confidence whether you know that's how it was supposed to sound or not. You just act like you, you just, you know, you walk into the building, you don't belong, just act like you belong, Okay. You just read the names out, and no one else can really tell you one way or the other uh, unless they can really just prove through the Hebrew. But might as well give you that little bit of advice. You've, you've at least got that going for you. If you learn nothing else, just read the Old Testament with confidence. Now, what we've just done is we've skipped all the way through to Genesis chapter 35. We find ourselves with a man named Joseph. I said Genesis 35. Genesis 37. I misspoke. Joseph's story is Genesis uh, chapters 37 through 50. Joseph had dreams. He had a dream where the sheaves of wheat bowed down to his. He had dreams where stars bowed. These dreams showed that his family bowed down to him. He was a younger brother. His brothers did not like the sound of this. So they dropped Joseph into a pit They sold Joseph into slavery. He's taken into Egypt. He suffered for years in slavery and imprisonment. But God raised him up to reign over Egypt next to Pharaoh. A fantastic story. Like maybe one day we'll have Ember Lectures on Joseph. There's so much in it. Watch this. What I want to point out is the big picture. Joseph's life followed a very intriguing progression. There's an interesting direction to his life. He was rejected and betrayed into a life of despair. He was supposed to be dead. They supposed that he was dead. But by the power of God, one who was thought to be dead was raised to unimaginable heights. You guys see an interesting progression in this? We look at all this picture, all this story as a whole picture, we see this fantastic pattern. Joseph would actually be able to bring Jacob, his father, and all of his family to Egypt where they would be taken for. And yes, that means that Joseph forgave his brothers. He graciously reconciled and reunited with his brothers that had sold him into slavery and attempted death to begin with. I'm just going to say it. That sounds a lot like the gospel, doesn't it? However, things would not last this way forever. We are now finding ourselves in the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, we see that eventually the Hebrews, as they were called, they became too numerous. The Egyptians became intimidated by how fast they were growing as a people. They were, you could say, multiplying and filling the earth. So a new Pharaoh took the throne. This new Pharaoh did not know Joseph. He put the Hebrews into slavery. They were slaves for 400 years. Put that into perspective. 400 years. That's essentially the history, if you kind of take it all in. It's the history of our country, 400 years. But I want to show you something. I want you to listen. You just stay where you are in the Bible, but listen to Genesis chapter 15. Yes, Genesis. I'm going backwards now. Genesis 15, verse 13. Listen to what God tells Abram when he's making his covenant. 
He says, then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. So now all of Joseph's people are experiencing what Joseph went through. They're experiencing the lowest depths of slavery and despair and bondage. And 400 years later, in Exodus chapter 3, God approached a man named Moses. Now in my notes again, God is bold, italicized, underlined. God is doing this. God is always doing this. This is God's story. I don't care if 400 years went by without much activity. God is still carrying out his purposes. If I can just have a quick devotional moment. Are you waiting on something in life? Do you feel like something's taking too long? Do you feel like God has forgotten you? God has not forgotten you. He is always caring about his redemptive plans. God approached a man named Moses. And Moses, like Joseph, belonged to the Hebrews. He also found himself in the household of Pharaoh. When he was just a newborn baby, Moses was smuggled and snuggled right next to the throne. God is doing all of this. And yet he had to go into exile for killing an Egyptian. So now Moses is in exile. While he's in the wilderness tending a flock of sheep, Moses saw a bush on fire and the bush was not burning up. As he approached the bush, Moses heard the voice of God. God said to him, I am the God of your father. The God of Abraham. The God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Just note here that he's saying, look, you're part of the story, Moses. I know that you belong to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, so on and so forth. 400 years before all of that. 500 years before all that. He says, I have certainly seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and I've heard their cry because of the taskmasters. I know their sufferings. I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. By the way, this is Exodus 3, verses 6 through 8. I should have pointed that out to you. Now, we'll just practice reading confidently to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. What he's just done is he's gone to Moses 400 years later. He said, I'm going to bring them out of the land of Egypt, and I'm going to take them to Canaan. I'm going to take them to the promised land, the very land that he promised back to Abraham all that while ago. And God demonstrated his power as the one true creator of the universe. So he conquers the false gods of Egypt by sending ten plagues to demonstrate his sovereignty. He shows he's the one true God with all these plagues. In the first plague, he turned water to blood. In the second plague, he swarmed the land of Egypt with frogs. Disgusting. In the third plague, he swarmed the land of Egypt with gnats. I was going through that just a couple weeks ago because it was too warm. In the fourth plague, he sent flies. In the fifth plague, he killed the livestock of Egypt. In the sixth plague, he afflicted the Egyptians with boils. Ew. That's the most articulate response I've got to that. In the seventh plague, he sent hail. Mind the southern accent, hail, H-A-I-L. In the eighth plague, he sent locusts. In the ninth plague, he covered the entire land with utter darkness. And for the final plague, he killed every firstborn son in every Egyptian household. However, for the Hebrew people, they were spared of this plague. He told them to take a lamb. This lamb had to be perfect, spotless, unblemished. And at God's command, they slaughtered the lamb. They ate it in a ceremonial dinner in a hurry. They had to be ready to go. They spread the blood of the lamb over the threshold of their home. And every home that was covered with the blood of the lamb was passed over 
by the angel of death. Now, I realize probably a lot of us, we know this and appreciate it, but I just wanted to make sure that we soak that in. It is the blood of the Lamb that is now covering the family. Blood was shed so that Adam and Eve could be covered. The blood of an animal who had done nothing to them. Not the blood of another animal, a lamb. Had to be perfect, spotless, unblemished. That blood is now being claimed so that the entire family, the household, is covered. Every home that was covered with the blood of the lamb was passed over by the angel of death. And finally, the Egyptians were willing to let the Hebrews go. They left that of Egypt. Pharaoh had a change of heart. It's another change of heart. If you know the story, you know that Pharaoh waffles back and forth. He chased them all the way to the Red Sea. They're trapped, and now they see the power of God. God tells Moses, lift up the staff. God splits the sea in two. They walk across on dry land. Walls of water on either side. They walk across on dry land. Then God caused the waters to come over Pharaoh and his army. Now, I want you to see this. Dry land appeared out of the waters, and then dry land was flooded by the waters. Does that sound familiar? That sounds a lot like the creation and the flood, doesn't it? Dry land appears. He just moves water to the side, and there's land. They walk across. Then you know what? Nope, i got to take care of this problem called Pharaoh and his army, and he just brings the water back, and they're flooded. Through Moses, God delivered his people. He has rescued them. God is their Savior. We find ourselves at Exodus chapter 20. Go ahead and turn to Exodus 20 in a moment. We're going to just cruise over the Ten Commandments, but let me just kind of lead up to there. Once God brought his people to Mount Sinai, he established a relationship with them, okay? He gave them his word, the law. He also instructed Moses how to design the tabernacle. Think, think this just amazing, ornate tent. And in the tabernacle, God would reside with his people. So now they've left Egypt. He's rescued them. Now it's time to establish a relationship with them, move forward together. And so he has them build this tabernacle in which his very presence would reside. The very presence of God would dwell in the tabernacle. And as God would lead his people to Canaan, they'd follow him. During the day, they saw God as a pillar of cloud, and they would follow him. During the night, they saw him as a pillar of fire, and they would follow him. Wherever he went, they were told to follow. If he stopped, they stopped. If he stayed for a few days, they stayed for a few days. If he moved, they moved. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, God, you just tell me what to do next. Okay, just stand here. Don't you ever wish it was like, oh, all right, he's moving. Here I go. Man, if we knew every day exactly what to do, this is all they'd do is follow God. They, he resided among them, and then we realized that just like we would be, didn't take long after the Exodus, after God saved his people from their bondage with all these miracles, with all this display of power, they start to grumble against him. They get hungry. They don't have any Snickers, so they're mad at the preacher. They got hungry and they complained. They got thirsty and they complained. Do you think you would have complained? Let, let's just for a moment. You just walked through the ocean, the sea on dry land. You just saw that. You just saw all the plagues. You saw God preserve your family at the blood of the Lamb, escort you through conquer Pharaoh's army, do you think you'd start grumbling in just a couple days? Yes, you would have. And so would I have. This, this is funny to me because we get on to them like, they're crazy. Why are they complaining? We would have too. They actually said they would have preferred, this is a lesson in leadership here. Ooh. They actually said they would prefer if God had left them in Egypt. Take that in for a moment. You know what, God? We appreciate you. We'd like to head on back, please. Because this is their rationale, then they at least had food to eat. And yet, God was faithful to lead them 
anyway. Let's just have another devotional moment. Let me just tell you, God is faithful to lead you anyway. And me. Despite your grumbling, despite spiritually speaking, you start to grumble, I'm hungry and I'm thirsty and what have you done for me lately anyway, God? The, the exodus, that was three days ago. What have you done for me lately? That's how we would be. We start to grumble like that, and yet God is faithful to lead you anyway. This should encourage you. Go ahead and just think. Don't say, you don't have to say it out loud. Just think. What is it that you're most ashamed of in your walk with the Lord? I mean, the things where you're just like, man. I just keep botching this up. I just keep stumbling. I keep grumbling. I always forget how much God blesses me. Let me encourage you. God is faithful to lead you anyway. Have you received the good news to the point where you realize you can say, God, in spite of this, you're going to take me where you want me. Thank you and praise him and receive his patience and his faithfulness. That's what we see. We see a patient, faithful God in the wilderness. Like patience we couldn't even understand. In Exodus chapter 20, God established his law with the people. This is what he told them, verse 1 and 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And he went on to give them the Ten Commandments. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Number two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heavens above or in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Number five, honor your father and your mother. Number six, you shall not murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Number eight, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number nine, you shall not covet. Where did number 10 go? Somehow I skipped number 10. Let me get through that. You shall not steal. Exodus 20, yeah. All right, well, thank you for that. Glad you all know your Old Testament better than my notes here. God also provided many other laws which were designed to help them. Now watch this. All these laws, you need to know this. You probably often get this wrong. We get this wrong a lot. We don't understand what the laws are for. These laws are designed, this is generalizing, to help them maintain their relationship with God. Maintain it. Not earn it. Not bring it about. To maintain the relationship that he has already established. He says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of this predicament. He's already saved them. And then he gives them all these laws to help them maintain that relationship. These laws help them understand when they were clean or unclean. They help provide for the forgiveness of sins. Think all the sacrifices. The laws help the people express their relationship with God through worship. God also provided priests for them. These priests would oversee their worship expressions and their sacrifices the priests would serve as liaisons between God and the people. So now, watch this, there are now humans who are able to go between God and his people to help connect deity and humanity. Someone in between. Let's take another time out. Let's do some more giveaways, okay? I want to give away Mr. Wright's book, I know that there is an intensity that we can hardly take right now. Margie Walls, congratulations. Ah, right there. All right. You are not Margie. So. <laughs> congratulations. Now we're going to give away, let's see here, let me describe this. This book here, a gentleman by the name of Vaughn Roberts wrote a book called God's Big Picture. I love that title, God's Big Picture. It's essentially what we're trying to accomplish with these types of le letters is lectures is look at God's word as the big picture, the story. The subtitle is Tracing the Storyline of the Bible. 166 pages if you include the epilogue. So uh, not, not too long, a nice simple book. 
Let's see who won this one. One of our small group leaders. All right. Oh, man. Dude, you've been getting stuff left and right, brother. Brandon Pelfrey. Give him a round of applause. That's what, about 15 books you've received over the last month or so? That's a pretty decent month. Never enough. How many books do y'all have? Not near enough. Okay, that's the answer. You can never have enough books. Okay, let's keep going. Now, uh, don't worry about turning there. Just listen to Numbers 2. Okay, everybody's favorite chapter, right? Numbers chapter 2. Okay, we see that God organizes the camp. Now, there's an interesting picture that we see given in Numbers chapter 2. God organized the 12 tribes of Israel in their camp. Okay, like their army camp. Always be reminded there's a very heavy military reality going on for them. They were to travel according to each tribe. On the east side were the tribes of Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. On the south side were the tribes of Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. On the west side were the tribes of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. And on the north side were the tribes of Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. And in the middle, as they traveled, was the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, which was carried by the tribe of Levi. They had the responsibility to, to gather all their stuff up, and every tribe had their place, and every tribe had their role, and all the Levites were broken into different groupings where they would carry everything. And watch this, God traveled in the midst of his people. So as I want to say this phrase that hopefully will really sound familiar in terms of the gospel. God was with them. He's God with us. And we see this picture where God is with them. Now, food for thought here. It appears as if Israel was an army who had to take care of and protect their God. That's what it would look like from the human perspective, right? They had to put up the tabernacle and make sure that God's, the Ark of the Covenant was on there and all that stuff. And they put it up, and move it around. They surrounded the Ark of the Covenant. They carried it. But here's the reality. God was the one taking care of and protecting his people. And it would have been good had the people of Israel realized this truth. If they got into the mindset that they were the ones carrying God around, not, not vice versa, that's when they got into trouble. You see them going to battle without the Ark of the Covenant. If you see them going to the battle when God said, don't do it, or do it a different way, it does not end well with them. And I want this to be a thought for us tonight, okay? I want you to be encouraged tonight. You do not carry God. You do not take care of Him. You do not protect Him. You don't have to worry about God. He is a big boy. He can take care of Himself. Know this. God carries you. God carries us. And you need to never forget this. But the tendency is we will forget it from time to time. Now you say, well, I never really forget that. You don't forget it here. But you can forget it here when you're worried about something, when you're fearful of something, when you think life is up against you in insurmountable ways, you need to remember God carries us. We do not carry him. So this is how they traveled. This is how they headed towards the promised land. God's army organized with their God among them. In Numbers 13 and 14, the story hits another tragic turn. God has faithfully and miraculously led his people all the way through the wilderness to the very border of the promised land. And when I say miraculously, I'm talking about he gave them water out of a rock. He's feeding them manna like bread falls from the sky. He leads them to the very border of the promised land. They sent spies into the promised land to investigate the land and the people's living there. God has given them his promise that he would conquer the land for them. Let me reiterate that. God has already promised that he would conquer the people of the land for his people. He's already shown his power, his victory by leading them out of Egypt. Now he intended to lead them into Canaan. But the spies came back and 10 of the 12 spies reacted in fear. They gave a bad report. They fostered unbelief 
among the people, they said, we can't do this. They're too big. It's too hard. It will never work. So God's people did not want to follow God into the promised land. Just put yourself there. After all this way, you've not forgotten the 400 years of bondage that you have in your heritage. You've seen God rescue you, lead you, provide for you, take care of you, design a relationship with you. You get to the promised land. You see it. People that represent you go into it. It's real. Everything is coming true, and yet you decide not to go. Because you're too scared and you start to grumble again and you want to turn back around. Do you think you would have turned around if you were with them? Yeah, probably. Most of us would. Most of us would have done the very same thing. Most of us would have said, you know what? We're not going to do this. We're going to turn around. I'm going to say, I say most of us because 10 of the 12 spies gave a bad report. Only Caleb and Joshua had the faith to encourage the people to go, but the people wouldn't listen. Think of how outnumbered Caleb, Joshua, and Moses must have felt. So here's what God did. God said that the entire generation would die in the wilderness. The entire generation was going to turn back around, wander around, until every man and woman of that generation died. Now, you talk about futility. Maybe Google search a little track of where they wandered for the generation and just take into account how small of a piece of land that really was when you think about it for all those years. They wandered around till they all died. God was determined to lead his people in the promised land. He's going to do what he promised he would do, but he would do it with the next generation. So here's what happened. This is the reality of their situation Think about it. Comprehensive death. Everybody died. Complete futility. They just wandered around. Absolutely zero progress for an entire generation. Forty years. They suffered the consequences of their fear, their lack of faith. And so when we get to the book of Deuteronomy, we're trying again. Moses is in the land of Moab. He's led the people there. As the book of Deuteronomy begins, we are with this next generation, the children of the Exodus. They have now come into adulthood. Once again, the people of God find themselves at the border of the promised land. And as they are just beyond the Jordan River, the Jordan River is the boundary. They're just beyond it. They're in the land of Moab. Moses again delivers the law. That's why it's named Deuteronomy, second law. Like, here we go again. He again delivers the law of God to the people of God. Moses is preaching in the book of Deuteronomy, his big long sermons. He's preparing his people to finally enter the promised land. He reminds them what their parents' generation had gone through. He reminds them of the wandering in the wilderness. He reminds them of the Ten Commandments, the tablets of stone, the golden calf. He reminds them of the Passover and the feast. And then he promises this, listen to this, he promises that a prophet like him would come one day. And that they should listen to every word that this prophet speaks. In other words, someone is going to come and speak the word of God with such power and significance that you better listen to everything he says. And he tells them how they are to live when God brings them into the promised land. And then he commissions Joshua to lead Israel into Canaan. And then Moses dies. Moses never got in there. Partly his fault. He had a temper tantrum. He had to suffer the consequences of his temper tantrum. I want you to look at Deuteronomy chapter 30 with me. I want to read a passage as you follow along. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 11 through 20. I just want us to hear this in a way where we respect and appreciate how God's word confronts his people 
and how it can even confront us. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. You hear the echoes of God's call on Abram's life? But if your heart turns away and you will not hear but are drawn away to worship after other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Life or death. At the risk of maybe sounding a little dramatic, I want to teach you the Old Testament Because the Old Testament is a matter of life or death. And we need to realize that. Now let's go ahead and take our final time out for giveaways. All right, now we are going to give away another book from Mr. Christopher Wright here. Karen Day. Where is Miss Karen? Right here in the front. Congratulations. All right. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for taking books. I love people that take books, as long as I know they're taking it. All right, now let's get an all-star in here, and then we got a superhero to acknowledge here. So let's roll this up. Oh, let me, just, let me explain this book here. Okay, now this book here, written by a guy named Alec Matir, looks like Matir, I believe it's pronounced Matir. This is called Look to the Rock. An Old Testament background to our understanding of Christ. See, guys, y'all got to get to where you pay attention to the subtitles, okay? It's the subtitles that you want to look at when you're collecting books. Y'all know that? This is a subtitle. An Old Testament background to our understanding of Christ. Like, when I see that, I'm like, what? Yes! Put that in the cart. Pay that thing. Send it to my house. An Old Testament background to our understanding of Christ. Look to the Rock by Alec Matir. And it's fantastic, by the way. Very good read. Rebecca Ward. Let's see, let's see. I saw her come in, I thought. Did she have to leave early? Oh, guys, this is fun when this happens. This is called, that's what happens. It is what it is, tragedy. We're going to have to call someone else's name. Hey, look, you walk out of my lecture, you can have repercussions and consequences, okay? (laughs) All right, if you think you've got something more important to go to, by all means, head on. We might just call your name, talk about you for a moment. Tish Klontz, did you stay in here? There we go. You won, you won, the, you won one of the biggies last year. I and I trust you've read it all verbatim. Sure. That was a mammoth that you got. Awesome. That's a good one. Now read that one slowly, okay? Oh, and, and by the way, let me say this. I always want to say this. When you're reading something, in all seriousness, think, think what you're reading. Don't just lap it up like a dog. I'm not necessarily giving you books that you'll agree with every single sentence, every single aspect of the thesis to it. We read lots of stuff. We've got to know how to think critically, read well. That one, it's fantastic, Tish, but just read it slowly. Don't try to, like, gulp it down or anything like that or it'd be kind of overwhelming. All right. Now, we got a superhero. Let's see here. I'm excited about this one right here. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to pull a name out of a, of a children's ministry leader, and you're going to get this. Now, we wanted to just kind of add a little bit. Uh, to how we've got these resources for the Ember Lectures. So we've got some children's books, okay, that uh, we vetted, we looked at, got excited about. And this particular set here, this is a set of books. Someone is about to win a trilogy, y'all, okay? 
That is awesome, all right? This is a trilogy. This little series is called Big Theology for Little Hearts. Does that not make your heart go pitter-patter? Big Theology for Little Hearts? That's what we want. Like, we want our church, like, yes, we're the church that gives Big Theology for Little Hearts. The first volume is called God. The second volume is the Gospel. The third volume is Jesus. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to read this book right here and now. This book is awesome. When is the last time a teacher stood in front of you and did this whole bit with a book? Are you ready? Creator. All that you see and do not see was created by God. That's fantastic. King. God is the ruler over all things forever. A little throne right there. Trinity. There are three equal persons in the one eternal God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Y'all, that is big theology for little hearts. Amen to that. Holy, God is perfectly unique and set apart from everyone and everything. Eternal, God has always been and will always be. Unchanging, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I have an idea. Some of you are like, I wish he'd have just read this for his lecture and been done with it. Just, God will never let the guilty go unpunished. Mm. Good. In all he does, God is right and good. I don't know if you can see in the back, that's a picture of milk and honey right there. All right. Loving. God is committed to his people and loves them with a never-ending love. Glory, last page, all things were made to praise and glorify God. That, yo, we just read a book. Give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> read a book, man. That's a good day. All right. I got so excited, I almost forgot we have to pick a name here, superhero name. Let's see here. Y'all. You're going to have to plug your ears. He might be too excited. Mr. Evan Bailey. Did you slip your name in there? You got a trilogy, dude. He was so sad. Man, last year I didn't win anything. I got to win something. You got three books, man. Three books. Fantastic. Use those. Uh, by the way, um, obviously one of the things that I hope we accomplish is as we display these books, some of y'all get interested in them, maybe look them up on Amazon or find them at a bookstore or something. But uh, children's leaders... Ask Nikki about these resources. We'd love for you to find ways to use them if you think it will work in your class. All right, let's bring it home. Yes, good timing here. Bring it home. We're going to find ourselves in the book of Joshua. Go ahead and turn to Joshua chapter 1. Uh, I, I wasn't skipping Leviticus on purpose. Let me mention this because I kind of had this in my notes originally and I took it out. Leviticus has all the laws in it. Um, so when I kind of mention all those types of laws, that was just me cruising over that portion uh, of the Old Testament. One day, Lord willing, we'll have an ember lectures on the book of Leviticus. In Joshua chapter 1, Moses has died. Joshua is now the leader of the people of Israel. And this is what God tells Joshua. I'm beginning reading in verse 2. We're going to read through verse 9. Arise. Go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I have promised to Moses. Skip on a little bit. He says, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and courageous, very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. And then I love this part. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. 
But ye shall meditate on it day and night, so that ye may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will ha- make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. It all boils down to God's word. You, know, you see that? It all boils down to being diligent with God's word. He says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let me just say this. In other words, God's telling Joshua, trust my promise to Abraham and follow the law I gave to Moses. And so as we just kind of cruise along in the narrative, in Joshua chapter 3, the people of God cross over the Jordan River. I want you to look in chapter 3, verse 14 with me. Chapter 3, verse 14. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priest bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of the water, then we were told, now the Jordan overflows all of its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan. And those flowing down toward the sea of the Arabah, the salt sea, were completely cut off. And the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priest bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. Once again, we see God moving water out of the way to make land appear. They go from the wilderness to the promised land. They cross on dry ground. In Joshua chapter 6 through 14, the people of God slowly but surely take over Canaan. They encounter several bumps along the way, but as long as they follow God by faith, he gives them victory. And in Joshua 16 through 24, we see that the people inherit their portions, their regions of Canaan. Just as God promised all along, he successfully brought his people into the promised land. He gave them his inheritance. Now go ahead and go to chapter 24. We're bringing it home. Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. Let's read these real quick. They're going to read one more little passage here. Chapter 24, verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord or serve Yahweh. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, Joshua says, we will serve the Lord. And then we're told that Joshua sent the people away, every man to his inheritance. Look down to verse 29. I want to read verse 29, verse 31, 32. After these things, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. Can you imagine if I'm still your pastor when I'm 110? I was being called old earlier before the lecture. I was being told I was old. Some of y'all think I'm young. Can't make anybody happy. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. As for the bones of, of Joseph, which the people of Israel brought up from Egypt, they buried them at Shechem in the piece of land that Jacob bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money. It became an inheritance of the descendants of Joseph. And so here's where we find ourselves in the story. The descendants of Abraham have entered the promised land, the promised inheritance that God has been preparing for them all along, and they had a calling to fulfill in it. Now here's where we want to finish tonight. I want to remind you of what their call was when God gave them the land. Genesis 12 verse 3 tells us this. God 
told Abram, through you all the families of the earth would be blessed. Through Abram's descendants, through God's people, all of the earth is to be blessed. God's story is about God carrying out his plans, his purposes, calling a man named Abram, and through his offspring, preparing blessing for all the families, all the people groups, all the nations of the earth who will experience the blessing of relationship with God. That's their calling. That's where we end tonight. We're going to see how well they did next week. But here's what I want us to do to close. I want us to think about this calling. God is still carrying out this story. He is still working out blessing all the families, all the nations, all the people groups, all the tribes of the entire earth in his glory. He wants to use us to this. And so I kind of hinted at this uh, this morning. So we wanted to add a little bit of an element to the Ember Lectures. And I have this going on last year. But I noticed some of you guys bought your coffee mug and your journal. Hold it up if you bought a coffee mug. Coffee mugs and journals are awesome. Okay, we are, we're selling those. Now we're selling those for a very particular reason. I just want to remind you, all of the proceeds for this is going to go uh, to a very exciting missional effort that you're going to learn about in just a moment. But months ago, when I was thinking about this particular January, I thought, how can we use this event called the Ember Lectures and just tie something missional to it? We have to have a passion for people throughout the world who do not know the name of Jesus. How can we do this? And so this is just one idea that we had. And so what we're doing is we're taking this money, and for every mug that's bought and every journal that's bought, all of the proceeds for that, we're going to go to this missional effort. And I've asked Randy Fanistil if he'll come up. Randy, are you in here somewhere? Oh, there you are. I thought you were over here for some reason. I felt your presence over here. You're like a, ventri- you're a, you're a body ventriloquist. I want Randy to come up. I asked him, gosh, 11 months ago, 10 months ago. I asked him to kind of lead our missions committee through a decision process uh, that I don't want to say much more about. So what I'm going to do is hand it over to him. You do what you're going to do, and then you close us, and you dismiss us. Okay? All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, I don't need anything. Hold on a second, Randy. Hold on, make sure they hear what you don't like about me. <laughs> Here, I'll let you hit that over the belt. All righty, got, got me? I can hear myself. There's only one thing I don't like about our pastor's teaching and his preaching. That's when it comes to an end. I usually sit over there, that's why he's thinking I'm over there in the morning uh, service. And when he finishes like this morning service, he wants to close some prayer. I'm thinking, no, don't stop. Keep going. Well, that was like this about two, about three weeks ago. He's preaching through Matthew, and he got to Matthew 24, 14. And, um, and he's preaching, and it's Jesus speaking. And he says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations, uh, and then the end shall come. And the word nations is the Greek word ethnos, ethnic group. So every ethnic group in the world is going to hear the gospel. Now, about six months ago, we were sitting over here near his office, and we were talking, and just sort of green light thinking about Chapin Baptist Church taking on a church plant among an unreached people group. What would that look like? So he tasked me with, the, um, uh, with finding an unreached people group somewhere in the world. And so I began researching that. And first, let's define unreached people group. It's a, a group of people, an identifiable group of people, either linguistically, socially, or ethno-linguistically, or um, anthropologically. They're identical as an identified group of people where there is no church. And there cannot be a church unless someone from the outside goes to those people for the purpose of planting a church. And I discovered that there are... 
7,414 UPGs, unreached people groups, in the world. And so that's where I began. And um, so I narrowed it down about two months ago, and I presented it to the missions committee, and they approved it. Pastor Hall was excited about it. And so I want to present those people to you this evening. And they are the people called Chomp, the Chomp people. They have got quite a history. They're over 2,000 years old, and they have still maintained their identity. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about them because we're going to be talking about them in the next couple of weeks um, because we're going to be sending these, these monies for the Enver Lectures to them for the help of planting this church. Uh, they've existed for about 2,000 years. Uh, in 1471, the Diet Viet people came in and took them over, made them slaves, um, killed a lot of them, and so they left as refugees. And um, the emperor of the Champa kingdom settled in what is today Cambodia, and they're still there to this day, still unreached, still on this list of seven of 7,414 according to the Joshua Project. They're the ones who keep track of this. Um, so amazingly enough, they have kept their identity as a distinct people group. There's a whole lot of history about them. We're going to go over that uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, but before I close in prayer, I just want to say that this is reachable. This looks like a lot of people, and probably in the millions, probably close to a billion, probably, um, the Khmer just right next to them are considered unreached. Uh, you've got people in China that are still unreached all over the place, uh, people in um, um, Kazakhstan and so on. But this is a very doable thing. When you imagine that there are over 40,000 Southern Baptist churches in the United States today, along with all the evangelical churches today, this is a very doable thing. What if Every 10th church, every 10 churches took on one of these. Because when one of these, typically what happens, when one of these unreached people groups plants a church, they're planting another church, and they're planting another church. And typically it's among an unreached people group. Anyway, that's where we're headed, and I just feel, just, I'm really excited about this. Um, and um, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, we read this. And they sing a new song saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals, for thou wast slain and didst purchase for God with thy blood men from every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation. It's going to come about. It's going to come about. It will happen. And um, I want to put one plug in to, if anybody's interested in this, and starting February 1st, we're going to be going through a session led by Chuck Middlebrooks, um, called The Perspectives of the World Christian Movement. If anybody's interested, we're going to meet here at 3.15 before this session starts, and we can give you more um, ideas about that. But basically, it's about missions history, uh, a, a total biblical theology of missions, from missions planning, uh, planning its histories, its strategies, and uh, everything that has taken place and will take place concerning missions. Um, I could say a whole lot more about it, but I won't. If you're interested in taking this course with us, we're going to start, like I said, February 1st. But if you're interested in it, we're going to talk about that course in and of itself next, next Sunday at 3.15. Well, let's go ahead and close our time in prayer. Father, we thank you for what you are doing in this world. Lord, you said that when the fullness of time came, you sent the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you that you have opened up our hearts. We thank you that you have um, allowed us to partake in the grace that you have for all those, Lord, who will be with you for eternity. And yet, Lord, we know that uh, just as um, you created Israel to be a light for the entire world to reveal your glory, we know, Lord, that the church has that same responsibility to reveal your glory to all the nations. We ask, Lord, that you allow us to be part of this and to accomplish your will in this world through all churches, Lord, just like our church here at Chapin Baptist. I thank you for my brothers and sisters here. I thank you for our pastor. 
I thank you, Lord, for how you are using us in the world today, in Zimbabwe, in Brazil, and in uh, Nova Scotia, and all the places that you have sent us out to. Pray, Lord, you would continue your work for your namesake. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.